Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 23rd and next to last of these 24 hours of reality. And I'm so excited to present the 23rd Reason for Hope. And during this hour, we're gonna have the great privilege of listening to an interview uh, of John Podesta, who is President Obama's uh, climate advisor in the White House, former chief of staff uh, for President Bill Clinton when I was in the White House. Uh, some years back, and John Podesta is one of the most talented, most intelligent, most impressive public servants I've ever had the privilege to serve with, so I'm very excited he's here. And I want to give you a quick preview of the 24th and final uh, hour of reality here. Lieutenant General Russell Honore, who is known as the Category 5 General when he went in and took control of that chaotic situation in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Everybody uh, just kind of instinctively realized they had to stand at attention, do what he said, because he has that air of authority. And he has uh, been devoting his life of late after his distinguished military career to fighting on behalf of people who don't have the voice and political power to fight back against pollution. He has seen the effects of the climate crisis firsthand. I'm really excited about uh, talking with him on this stage. Really, it is an honor uh, to have him coming up in the next hour. But now, the 23rd reason for hope. We talked about state and regional governments in the last hour. So many exciting developments there and especially important in those countries where the national politics seems to be paralyzed. But around the world, cities and their mayors have long been at the forefront of climate leadership. And their work continues today as many of the largest cities around the world take bold action on the climate crisis. This really is a powerful reason for hope. Cities from New York to Beijing, from Helsinki to Melbourne, Cities have taken bold leadership positions on the climate crisis, and it really is stunning what some of these cities have done. Let's look uh, at a few of the facts about what cities are doing to successfully use renewables and energy efficiency to build jobs and economic opportunity and to promote smart growth. And it is working, and the people like it because they know that it makes sense. So, First of all, to set the stage here, just in the last four years, we have seen an historic development without any precedent in the entire history of human civilization. For almost all of human history, the percentage of our human population living in cities was no more than 10 or 15% of the total. But in 2010, only four years ago, for the very first time in history, the majority of the people on Earth lived in cities. The urban population has been climbing dramatically, and the rural population, as a percentage of the whole, has been declining significantly. There are a lot of implications uh, uh, of this. Cities uh, are actually pretty efficient places to live, and the environmental analysts who study these things are pretty much in agreement on that, particularly if the cities have leaders and citizenries that take hold of the opportunities to implement efficiency and sustainability standards and smart, uh, efficient transportation systems and retrofitting of buildings and all the other things we're going to talk about uh, during this hour. But the, but the most important implication and why this is a reason for hope is that when we implement solutions to the climate crisis, they have got to be implemented in cities because that's where the majority of our people live now. This is truly uh, an historic change in human history. Cities consume over two thirds of the world's energy. So steps taken in cities obviously have a huge impact on our ability as a civilization to solve the climate crisis. And we are blessed for whatever reason, I think it has to do with the changing nature of politics at the local versus 
the national level, we are blessed with a large group of visionary mayors around the world who have really taken bold initiatives and who have worked together to share ideas uh, and to take the best ideas that are working in one city and apply them in other cities and in the opposite direction. So this is really a very uh, positive development. Let's look uh, at a few uh, examples of what we're talking about. First of all, let me uh, take a moment to compliment this C40 organization. This is a group of mayors of large cities that have banded together to do exactly the things I was just talking about. 69, they call it the C40, but 69 of these cities <clears throat> around the world have pledged to take bold action on climate. And you can see the ones in red are on the steering committee and the rest of them. Uh, as a group, they are really beginning to make a tremendous difference and it really is a powerful reason for hope. Copenhagen, Denmark has a, a, a very good solid plan to become the first carbon neutral capital city uh, in the world by 2025. Now I say that with a, an asterisk or a caveat because Vatican City may beat them to it uh, and they've got two advantages. Uh, they're very small and God is on their side. But leaving that aside, Copenhagen wants to take that title among the major capital cities. Stockholm ha has reduced its, uh, its global warming emissions by 35% over the, the period uh, of, of just 17 years. At the same time, uh, they grew their economy in Stockholm by 41%. That is one of the highest growth rates in Europe. So they have <clears throat> some of the steepest reductions in global warming pollution while simultaneously having one of the highest economic growth rates. Now they have a carbon tax and that's one of the reasons for it. And by the way, the carbon tax there uh, became so popular that a conservative government felt like it was a good thing to make it even steeper. Now, of course, conservatives uh, over there are a little bit different from conservatives in the U.S., but uh, the politics are, are not all that different. So in Denmark, uh, this city of Frederikshavn hopes to be powered completely by renewable energy by next year, and they're going to do it. Uh, here in Helsinki, this is an example of something cities can do that really makes a difference. It's called district heating. They use the excess heat from the data center that they, big data center under their main cathedral to pipe the hot air through these tunnels to give very low cost, sustainable heating to buildings throughout the center of the city. And a lot of people have never heard of this option known as district heating, but it is an incredibly efficient way for cities to reduce their consumption of power uh, and remain comfortable uh, in the winter at extremely low cost. I in uh, Germany, this is a city that already gets 100% of its energy from renewable sources. And many other cities are trying to emulate this example. Some of them are on the verge of doing it. In Southern Europe, uh, in Barcelona, this is a good example of a city that requires solar hot water heaters on every structure. They have reduced their carbon intensity by 30% just in the last 14 years, and they have seen a 4,000% increase in the solar photovoltaic panels uh, since the year 2000. Very inspiring work in a very beautiful city, unique city, as those of you who've seen Barcelona know. Okay, let's move to Asia. Singapore is often cited by many people as one of the best governed, best managed nations. It's a, it's a city-state nation, and of course, their history is quite inspiring. They were uh, cut off from Malaysia, a lot of political turmoil, and they just pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, and they have created one of the most dynamic economies in the entire world. Well, they've decided that they're going to have these green buildings, the most efficient standards you can possibly have. And they're already 
to a point where one fifth of all the square footage uh, of real estate on the entire island meets uh, the, the highest standards for green buildings. It's really quite uh, impressive. So in Delhi, India, where there's a whole uh, different situation, they need to have uh, retrofits and the installation, uh, the installation of better windows and lights and insulation and all of that. But they have themselves taken some very innovative and bold steps. And just this month, they introduced net metering. And you know what that is. What that means is people who put solar photovoltaic panels on their rooftops <clears throat> can use all the energy they want. And when they have some left over, they can sell it back into the grid and make money to offset the cost uh, of, other, uh, of their other expenses. And this has the effect of encouraging many more people to install solar panels. Uh, it, it is a, a, a very exciting uh, and hopeful development. Here in the United States, uh, the great city of Chicago has doubled its wind power use. Uh, it's opened the country's largest urban solar power plant. Uh, it's cut its carbon emissions already by 16%. It's put in place a really cool one-day permitting process uh, for home solar, and it is encouraging the switch uh, to renewables in a very powerful way. So in Los Angeles, I was present when the former mayor uh, of uh, Los Angeles, Mayor Villaraigosa, uh, announced that Los Angeles will completely stop using any coal-based electricity by the year 2025. And they have put in place a step-by-step -step plan to achieve this goal. Uh, there's no doubt that they will. A smaller city, you wouldn't think of a, a place like Rockport, Missouri doing this, but they are the first 100% wind-powered town in the United States. And there are a lot of other towns and cities that want to follow their example. Uh, and with the cost coming down so rapidly, they're gonna do it. Austin, Texas, great dynamic uh, city. They're, they're purchasing 700 megawatts of solar power, and they've announced that solar is the new default uh, generation resource. And this makes sense economically. It also makes sense in establishing Austin as one of the leaders among cities in navigating this important transition to renewable energy. Okay, let's go to Australia and look at their two biggest cities. The city of Sydney, often described as one of the most beautiful cities in the world, has made plans to be 100% renewable by the year 2030. They've got a solid plan. I've looked at it. They're going to achieve this goal. And their neighbor and occasional rival for bragging rights, uh, Melbourne, often labeled the most livable city in the world, by the way, also very beautiful, they plan to produce zero net emissions by the year 2020. So this is uh, extremely encouraging news because even at a time when some of the national governments, Australia among them, has political paralysis, of course it's the largest coal exporter in the world, it also happens to be ground zero for the biggest impacts on any nation of the climate crisis, but the coal industry has been uh, uh, throwing its weight around uh, there. Uh, and yet, even with the paralysis at the national level, their cities and some of their uh, regional governments, like the state of uh, Victoria, I could have included them in the last hour, are really exercising dramatic leadership. Also, a lot of cities have joined this divestment movement. We are seeing all of these cities completely divest from fossil fuels, another way that cities are providing leadership. So if you are ever tempted in the least f to feel discouraged about getting movement towards solutions for the climate crisis, and you've been reading about uh, paralysis in uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, turn to your cities and to your uh, state governments, because you will find many leaders there who are providing bold, dynamic, and innovative leadership reducing emissions and helping to solve the climate crisis 
And that is definitely the 23rd reason for hope.